My name is Quinn, and I am a bookseller here at the Reading Room CLE. Tonight, I will be reading our proprietress Shasha, her bedtime story, as always. This is part two of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. And when Shasha said, are you going to read part two, I said, well, you wore your Frozen costume yesterday, and she said, but I have the Family Genius shirt, which is Frozen colors, which is true, it is. And she said, and besides, you could give me some of that ham-flavored Italian ice. And I said, could I now? And so that is what she is enjoying. Part two of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, a little boy and a little girl. In the great city, where there are so many houses and people that there isn't room for everyone to have a little garden of his own, so most of them have to be content with flowers and flower pots, there lived two poor children who did have a garden a bit larger than a flower pot. They weren't brother and sister, but they were just as fond of each other as if they had been. Their parents were next door neighbors living in attics, at the point where their roofs were almost touching, and the gutter ran along between the eaves. Each house had a window facing the other. You only had to step over the gutter to cross from window to window. The parents of the two children each had a big wooden box outside, and in this grew pot herbs, which they used, and a little rose tree. There was one in each box, and they grew beautifully. One day, the parents thought of placing the boxes across the gutter in such a way that they nearly reached from one window to the other and looked exactly like two banks of flowers. The sweet pea tendrils hung down over the boxes. The rose trees put out long branches, twining round the windows and leaning toward each other. It was almost a triumphal arch of greenery and flowers. Since the boxes were very high, and the two children knew that they mustn't crawl up onto them, they often got leave to climb out to each other and, sitting on stools under the roses, have wonderful games there. In winter, of course, that sort of fun came to an end. The window panes were often frosted right over, but then the children warmed up pennies on the stove, placed the heated coin on the frozen pane, and in this way made a splendid peephole as round as could be. Behind there peeped a gentle loving eye, one from each window. It was the boy and the girl. His name was Kay. Hers was Gerda. In summer, they could reach each other with a single jump. In winter, they must first go down a lot of stairs, then up a lot of stairs, while outside the snow would be steadily falling. Those are white bees swarming, said the old grandmother. Do they have a queen as well? asked Kay, for he knew that real bees have a sort of queen. Yes, they have, said the grandmother. She flies just where the swarm is thickest, and she's the biggest of them all. She never lies still on the ground. She flies up again, into the black cloud. On many a winter night, she flies through the streets of the town and peeps in at the windows, and then they freeze into curious patterns, just like flowers. Yes, I've seen that, cried both children at once, and so they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? asked Gerda. Just let her try, said the boy. I'll put her on that hot stove and she'll melt. But the grandmother smoothed his hair and told them some other stories. In the evening, when Kay was home again and half-dressed, he crawled up onto the chairs by the window and peeked out through the little hole. A few snowflakes were falling outside, and one of these, the biggest of them all, remained lying on the edge of one of the flower boxes. The snowflake grew larger and larger till at last it became the figure of a woman dressed in the most delicate white gauze, which was made up of millions of tiny star-shaped flakes. She was pretty and distinguished looking, but a figure of ice, glaring, glittering ice. Yet she was alive. Her eyes stared like two bright stars, but there was no peace or quiet in them. She nodded toward the window and beckoned with her hand boy grew frightened, and he jumped down from the chair, and at that moment a large bird seemed to fly past the window. Next day there was a clear frost, and this was followed by a thaw. After that came the spring. The sun shone, bits of green peeped out, the swallows built their nests, the windows were thrown open, and once more the two children sat in their garden high up by the gutter in the very top of the house. The roses were especially fine that summer. The girl had learned a hymn that had a bit about roses in it, and these roses made her think of it. She sang it to the boy, and he joined in. 
The valley glows with many a rose, and there we meet the holy child. What beautiful summer days those were. How wonderful it was to be out beside the fresh rose trees which never seemed to want to stop blooming. Kay and Gerda sat looking at a picture book of birds and animals when suddenly, just as five o'clock was striking from the tall church tower, Kay called out, Ow! Something's pricking me in the heart. Ow! And now I've got something in my eye. The little girl put her arm round his neck. He blinked his eyes. No, there was nothing to be seen. I expect it's gone, he said. But it hadn't gone. It just happened to be one of those glass splinters that flew from the looking glass, the imp glass, that made everything great and good seem small and ugly, but what was evil and wicked stood out sharply and every flaw showed up at once. Poor Kay had received a piece right in his heart, which would presently turn into a lump of ice. For the moment, the piece of glass had stopped hurting, but it was still there. Gerda, why are you crying? He asked. It makes you look so ugly. There's nothing whatever the matter with me. Ugh! He cried suddenly. That rose has a worm in it, and look how crooked that one's growing. They're rotten roses when you come to think of it, just like the boxes they're growing in. And he kicked the box hard and broke off the two roses. Kay, what are you doing? exclaimed Gerda, and when he saw how upset she was, he broke off another rose and ran in at his window away from her. Next time she got out the picture book, he said the book was babyish, and if their grandmother told them stories, he always chipped in with an, ah, but he would even, if he got the chance, go behind her, put on some spectacles, and talk just like her. It was a perfect imitation and made people laugh. After a while, he could mimic the voice and the walk of every single person in the street. Kay knew how to take off all their awkward peculiarities so that people said, that boy certainly has a remarkable head on him. But it was really the bit of glass in his eye and the bit of glass in his heart which made him tease even Gerda, who loved him from the bottom of her heart. The games he played now were quite different from the old ones. They were quite sophisticated. One winter's day, as the snowflakes were drifting down, he picked up a big magnifying glass, and holding out the flap of his blue coat, he let the snowflakes fall on it. Take a look through this glass, Gerda, he said, and every snowflake became much larger and looked like a splendid flower or a six-pointed star. It was a wonderful sight. Do you see how that is, said Kay. These are much more interesting than real flowers, and there isn't a single flaw in them. They are perfect in every way, as long as they don't melt. A little later, Kay arrived with big gloves on and his toboggan on his back. He shouted into Gerda's ears that he had been told he might go tobogganing in the main square where the others were playing, and away he went. Over in the square, the boldest boys often tied their toboggans onto a farmer's cart and were carried along for a good distance. It was grand sport. In the midst of the fun, a large sledge drove up, all painted dead white. In it sat a figure, muffled in a white fur coat and wearing a white fur cap. The sledge drove twice around the square, and in a twinkling, Kay managed to fasten his toboggan behind it so that it pulled him along. Faster and faster they went, straight into the next street. The driver of the sledge, with a turn of the head, gave Kay a friendly nod, just as if they knew each other. And each time that Kay thought of loosening his toboggan, the person nodded again. And so Kay stayed where he was, and they drove straight out of the town gate. Now the snow began to fall so thickly that the boy couldn't see his hand in front of his face as he rushed along. He quickly let loose the rope so as to get away from the big sledge. But it didn't work. His toboggan was still held fast, and they scudded along like the wind. He yelled at the top of his voice, but no one heard him. And the snow whirled down, and the sledge flew on. Now and then it did a jump, as though they were crossing ditches and hedges. Kay was absolutely terrified. He tried to say the Lord's Prayer, but all he could remember was the multiplication table. The snowflakes got bigger and bigger till at last they looked like great white chickens. All at once they sprang aside, the big sledge stopped, and the driver stood up. Coat and cap were pure snow. It was a woman, tall and straight, white and glittering. It was the Snow Queen. You've covered the ground well, she said, but do you feel cold? Creep into my bearskin, and she put him beside her in the sledge and wrapped the furs round him. It was like sinking into a snowdrift. 
Are you still cold? She asked, and then she kissed his forehead. Oh, her kiss was colder than ice. It went right to his heart, which was nearly a lump of ice already. He felt as if he were dying, but only for a moment. After that, all was well, and he didn't notice the cold anymore. My sledge! Don't forget my sledge! That was the first thing he thought of, so it was fastened to one of the white chickens which came flying along behind them. The Snow Queen kissed Kay once more, and after that, he had quite forgotten Gerda and Granny and all the others at home. You mustn't have any more kisses, said the Snow Queen, or else I shall kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. She was very beautiful. He couldn't imagine a more intelligent, lovelier face. She no longer seemed to be just a figure of ice, as he had thought. In his eyes, now she was perfect. He didn't feel a bit afraid, but described to her how he could do mental arithmetic, even with fractions, and that he knew the number of square miles there were in all the different countries and what's the population, and she kept smiling back at him, so that he began to think that perhaps what he knew was hardly enough. And he looked up into the great spaces of the sky, and she flew along with him high up on the black cloud, and the wind roared and whistled. It reminded one of the old folk songs. They flew over woods and lakes, over sea and land. Below them, the icy blast whistled. The wolves howled like you, Chacha. The snow sparkled as the black crows flew screaming across it, but high above everything shone the great silver moon. Kay gazed up at it through the long, long winter night. And by day, he slept at the Snow Queen's feet. That is the end of part two of Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen. Cha-cha and I will see you back here tomorrow for part three. In the meantime, sleep well and keep reading.